Hey, did you know that plastic is produced with oil? A fossil fuel that pollutes the environment. Wouldn't it just be awesome if we could live our lives without plastic? Well, there's a company that wants to help you do just that. Life Without Plastic. They sell products that will reduce or eliminate your dependence on plastic. They have a large selection of products like toothbrushes, food storage containers, drinking straws. And the best part is that they're also very reasonably priced. So what are you waiting for? Check out all these great plastic-free products and help save the planet. Just click on the link in the show notes to find out more and to start your journey to being plastic-free. Hello, friends. I'm Paul, and yes, this is the Nature Wander podcast. Thank you for wandering through nature with me today. I am once again in the wilds of my own backyard, just checking out this nice autumn afternoon, checking out all the cool stuff that's out in the yard today. Um, If you are listening to this on the day of release, happy Thanksgiving. Um, Hopefully you have plenty to be thankful for. I'm thankful that we have a beautiful, beautiful world to live in. Yeah, all this nature around us. And if you're listening to this day after it was released because you were too busy on Thanksgiving to listen to it, then I'd like to wish you a happy Indigenous Peoples Day. And, of course, you're probably thinking, oh, yeah, it's also... Um, insane Friday, or not insane Friday, but yeah, Black Friday. Oh, please, please, please do me a favor. Don't support those big box companies that basically are, they're harming the environment. You know, they're importing stuff from all over the world, which, which brings me to the next thing I'd like to talk about is is the following day. Maybe you're listening to this on Saturday. You're all worn out from doing all your shopping. And um, today, Saturday, would be Small Business Saturday. Yeah, I love promoting Small Business Saturday. Not just because my wife has a small business, owns a small business, um, but it's also because basically Small Business Saturday is supporting your community, your neighbors, your neighborhood. It's supporting the small mom and pop shops, but it's also, believe it or not, helping the environment. You see, if you are going to one of these big box stores that ships stuff all the way from China or or wherever, Europe, and it's going over the ocean, it has to get here somehow, either by by ship or by airplane, and all those fossil fuels that are powering the airplane or the boat or however it got here. Uh, Maybe you are buying something that came from the United States, but it's from way over on the other side of the country. That's where it came from. It still had to get here, usually by, well, in that case, it's either by plane or it's by a truck and therefore you've got more fossil fuels being used and all of this is basically polluting the environment okay you've got all the fumes coming from these vehicles from these airplanes and it's creating pollution air pollution um, noise pollution it's it's using our natural resources Um, Everyone always thinks, oh, well, there's plenty of oil in the ground. No, there isn't. Um, There's been a lot of studies. Well, I won't get into it too much, but we will eventually run out. And it's not too far off either. It's best to go to these small mom-and-pop shops, especially the ones that buy things locally, okay, locally sourced. There's several shops I'd like to just briefly mention if you live in the western New York area. Of course, I'm going to promote my wife's pottery shop. 
great holiday gifts. Everyone loves pottery. So um, it's Black Raven Pottery on the Roycroft campus, the historic Roycroft campus in East Aurora, New York. It's in the lower level of the Antiques building. And right above it, maybe you're into antiques. Okay, another small business, the Roycroft Antiques. So all of these are naturally sourced, or locally, I should say, sorry. Um, everything at my wife's shop, Black Raven Pottery, is made right there. It's produced right there. Um, she, her and I try to keep the business as green, environmentally friendly as possible. Uh, we do as much as we can to keep it nice and green and environmentally friendly. Uh, some other businesses I'd like to promote that do small and local. Um, everything is produced locally or or they try to as much as they can. You're supporting the small you know, business. Right in Buffalo, if you live in the Buffalo area, on Elmwood Avenue, two of my favorite businesses there are Thin Ice. They have a lot of artisans that supply their merchandise. Local artisans. Um, the next door to them is put a plant on it. And once again, she's really big, the owner is really big on supporting local businesses, or local artisans, I should say. Um, and she gets a lot of her product, too. Her pots are made by local artisans. So those are two in Buffalo. Uh, if you're out in the Delvin Arcade area, I do some of my shopping at Pierce Milling. Pierce Milling is where I get a lot of my bird seed and such, but I also at Pierce Milling can get, you know, dog gifts. I, I've got Rivia walking with me, so I can't tell you what I got her. Uh, but yeah, some of our, our dog gifts come locally. We try to get stuff that is purchased at small businesses. In Springville, there is also Mark's Country Store. They have a lot of gifts for your pets, for you, for friends, for whoever. Um, so Mark's and Pierce Milling are two of my favorites in this area. In East Aurora, there are so many small businesses. So East Aurora, New York, one of my absolute favorites is Vittler's. Yeah, Vittler's, right on Main Street. You can't find something, it's there. Yeah, they do get a lot of products that are shipped in, but they also have products that are locally made, um, a lot of locally made products. And you are, once again, supporting the small business, so you are helping the local economy and, in the long run, helping the environment, too. So these are just a few, just a few. There's so many small businesses out there. So please, Small Business Saturday, that's when you should be doing all your gift shopping. So you should go out and support the small businesses. And if you can't get out on Small Business Saturday, it doesn't have to be a certain day. Get out there any day and support the small businesses. Okay, enough of this long-winded advertisement. Uh, oh, no, it isn't. One more. Okay, one more. have to promote myself, too. There's also, um, in my wife's shop, Black Raven Pottery, where you can go to Masterson's Greenhouse, and they're just outside of East Aurora on Route 16. Uh, Masterson's Garden Center. They carry a lot of awesome stuff, but they have some wire art, and some fairy doors, which are great gifts for kids. Kids love the fairy doors. They can put them out in the summertime in the woods, and hopefully some fairies will come along through them. The reason I'm promoting those is because I make the fairy doors. Yeah, so a little hobby I do on the side. So making fairy doors and wire art, wire fairies. So Masterson's Greenhouse, also at Black Raven Pottery. They're both there. Um, so, anyhow, the topic I want to talk about today is something that, uh, it's one of those critters that gets a bad reputation. I've had my battles with them. I'm sure a lot of other people have, too. It's a critter we don't like in our house, but they often find their way into our house, and it's probably not good having them in our house. You know, they can spread disease. So you have to be really careful when you're cleaning up around them. 
And I'm actually coming up right now to a place where they like to hang out. Yeah, I've got 26 bluebird boxes on my property here. And of course the bluebirds, the other birds that use the bluebird boxes, I get a lot of tree swallows in them during the summer. I get some um, wrens in them and I also get some black capped chickadees. And they like using the boxes for nesting, obviously. But there's another friend after the nesting season's over and they're gone. There's another friend of ours who likes to use them for the winter time to stay warm. Yeah, a critter that doesn't like cold because they are very small. They can't handle the cold. So that's why they're headed into our houses and looking for places like our sheds or in our nest boxes. Yeah, I'm talking about mice. Mice is our topic for today. I don't know if you remember me saying in the past, I've said it in different episodes, how we fear what we don't understand. And it can go a little bit further as to say we don't like sometimes what we don't understand. We hate things that we don't understand. You know, that critter is doing this to annoy me. That mouse got into my house and chewed through my electric wires to annoy me. No, they're doing it because that's what they do. I mean, I've had some bad experiences with mice. They've gotten into my shed. They, I store my tractor, my lawn tractor in my shed during the winter time, along with a lot of my other equipment, like my rototiller, uh, battery operated rototiller, it's awesome. Um, but I do store a lot of my summer stuff in my shed. I've had mice chew through some of my lawn chairs before. I've had the mice get into my shed and they chewed through the wiring on my lawnmower. And there was so much damage, I couldn't fix it myself. I ended up having to take it in and it cost me like 200 bucks to have it. Actually, I think it was more than that. It was a few years ago, so I don't remember exactly how much, but it cost me quite a bit of money to have that repaired. Is that the mouse's fault? No. It's what they do. You know, it's my fault for not trying to keep them out of my shed. And we'll talk a little bit about that later. Uh, I've had the quiet little mouse. You ever hear that saying? Quiet as a mouse. Yeah, well, they're not so quiet. Not in the middle of the night when they're running through my rafters up in my ceiling because somehow they got into my house. Yeah, they're noisy. Or sometimes they drop down into my wall in between the walls because there's a hole up in the top where the wire, the wiring runs through. And they found that hole and snuck right down in there. And then they're sitting there scratching in the wall and driving my dog crazy and so dogs. And the dogs are basically listening to the wall, sometimes scratching at the wall. It's like, yeah, quiet as a mouse. No! Noisy little critters. So, yeah, I've had my, my bad experiences with mice myself, but does that mean we should hate them? No, they're part of the ecosystem. You know, they're part of the food chain, part of the food web. So mice have their purpose too. Um, the, this, is, this is kind of funny, you know, the name mouse, it actually comes from Sanskrit word, which is moose, M-U-S, meaning thief. Yeah, because when they saw the mice and named them this moose, which means thief, they were basically like, oh man, these darn little critters are stealing from me all the time. Yeah, they steal our food, our shelter, they get into our house and try to stay warm in there. Yeah, water, whatever, they're always stealing stuff from us. Sometimes our nerves, too. So, <laughs> mice got their name because they are considered a thief. Mice are actually in the family Muridae with over 1,000 species in the world. That's a lot. 
There's over 2,000 species in 30 different family in the order Rodentia. Yeah, mice are a rodent. And therefore, they're in the family. I'm sorry, the order. They're in the order, if you know taxonomy. They're in the order Rodentia. And like I said, over 2,000 species, 30 families. There are over 2,050 species of mammals characterized as rodents. Now, the rodent family, the characteristics that make them a rodent is they have an upper and lower pair of ever-growing rootless incisor teeth. So those really sharp front teeth, top and bottom, in the mouth are always growing. Rodents are the largest group of mammals. Almost half of the mammalia class is rodentia, rodents. Ever-growing teeth. Yeah. Why don't they grow into their skull? I think I've talked about this in a past episode episode about, um, I think it was our, our groundhog episode, because they're actually a type of rodent and their teeth are ever growing. But I had a friend who used to rehabilitate groundhogs, and she had one that got hit by a car, knocked the jaw out of whack, didn't kill it, but it knocked the jaw out of whack, and the vet could not get it back in place. So it always had this slight lower jaw that was kind of crooked. It was off to the side a little bit. So the upper and lower jaw didn't line up. And because of that, the teeth, ever growing, they kept growing so far beyond where they should have. The poor thing couldn't grind them down on the other teeth or even when they were eating. So this rehabilitator couldn't release it and she ended up having to I think it was like once a month she would have to take a file and file them down, you know, a nail file. Otherwise, the teeth would have kept growing and gone right into the skull and killed the poor thing. So if it was out in the wild, it never would have made it. So they have ever-growing teeth. How do they keep them from doing that, going into their skull, growing too far? Well, the way they do it is they keep grinding them down. Hmm explains why they're always chewing on stuff, even stuff that they don't need. Yeah, of course, they're going to chew on food, they're going to eat food, but why are they chewing through our wires? Now, well, sometimes they're trying to get material for nests. Yeah, nesting material. But if they're outside, I know in my nest box, I'm coming up to one now. In my nest box, yep, there's a mouse in there. I'm not going to open it up. Uh, but I can tell there's a mouse in there because I'm looking in the nest box hole. I see all sorts of fluff from the plants. I'm seeing some r reeds in there. I'm seeing some grasses. I'm seeing all sorts of stuff in there, uh, even a few sticks. But a lot of fluff, too, sticking out. So they're taking, like, the um, fluff from a milkweed and they carried it up into the box and they put it in there so i see it all sticking out and so i know they're in there nesting so they're gathering that stuff outside how are they grinding down their teeth oh i know maybe on their food when they're chewing on the bones and okay these guys mice usually they're eating grains they're omnivores which means they be eat both plants and animals, but the main diet is plants. Grasses, grains, seeds, that's what they're mostly eating. Occasionally they will eat insects, they'll eat worms, they'll eat, you know, other things besides plants. And that's why we put them in as omnivores. So how are they grinding the teeth down? Well, they're chewing on other things. Uh, if they do find a dead animal, they might chew on, they might eat some of the meat, but they might chew on the bones of that animal. Um, they actually will chew on deer antlers after a shed. The reason is to get the calcium from the deer antler, but also to grind those teeth down. And if they're in their house, they're chewing on the wires. 
or the wires on my lawnmower, or they're chewing on some wood in our house. They're chewing on all sorts of different things that they don't need except to wear down their teeth so that they don't grow too far. So that's why they're always chewing. Yeah, that's why we always find these mouse chews in our sheds and places where we really don't want them. In the U.S., there are more than 70 species of mice and rats. Eight are very common. Okay, so we have eight very common species, and they include species in the New York, anyhow. We have um, house mice, deer mice, white-footed mice. Uh, we also have the woodland jumping mouse. And you're probably wondering, well, what's missing here? And now, I'm walking through a field. My property is mostly field, open field. I shouldn't say open. And it's, it doesn't have a lot of trees in the middle of it. There are a few. But I don't mow it. So I've got some tall grasses. That's why I'm not sure I should consider it an open field. But it is. There's a lot of open field. Um, I'm actually walking on the section between my neighbors and my property. And they do hay their fields. So it's very short grasses. But mine is much taller. But anyhow, I'm in the field. Where's the field mice? Yeah, well, I don't include them in the common species only because I already mentioned them, sort of. It, it gets confusing at this point, I know. Um, I don't want to confuse you too much, but essentially the term field mice. Some people will actually say, well, there is such a thing as a field mouse, and they're kind of right. It's a generic term. So some people consider the field mouse the the eastern meadow vole. Some people actually call the eastern meadow vole the meadow mouse. Um, also, the eastern deer mouse is also considered the field mouse. So that's what I mean. The field mouse is kind of a generic term, unless you're in Europe. If you're over in Europe and you're listening to me, you're probably screaming at your speakers right now. You're... you're um, your, your podcast, whatever you're listening to it on, you're screaming at it like, there is a field... Well, there is an old world field mouse over in Europe, yes. So there is such a creature, a species, as an actual field mouse. But here in the U.S., now it's more of a generic term to describe a bunch of different mice who live, where else? In the field. <laughs> okay, so... And this is funny because some field mice, or under the term of field mice, some of them don't even live in the field. They are part-timers in the field, and they're part-timers in the woods. So they share a lot of different habitats. So the term field mouse, okay, it's more of a generic name. Uh, there's also one that's very common in my area, known as the white-footed mouse. Um, Paromyscus leucopus, and I probably pronounced that wrong. I've never been very good at the Latin names. Hard to pronounce these guys. Uh, but that's the white-footed mouse, and some people say that is the field mouse. So I mentioned earlier the eastern meadow vole, or the meadow mouse as some people call it. The eastern meadow vole. So what's the difference between a vole and a mouse? Okay, so there are differences. First of all, a vole, they are usually brown in color, which mice can be gray, brown. Uh, they're big, and they have a blunt nose. The mouse has big ears and big eyes and a very long tail. Voles, their tails are usually shorter. And I'm going to throw a couple of other terms in here, too. They're going to really mess you up. Okay, a mole. Okay, M-O-L-E, a mole. These guys have big shoulders. They have claws because they spend most of their lives under the ground. They're the ones that we're always complaining about in the springtime when we come out after the snow is melting and we see all the, all the dirt around our yard, around our, our, our lawn where the, vol the moles, sorry, the moles were tunneling. Yeah, so um, they need those long claws for digging. And they usually have a long tail as well. Um, there is also a shrew, S-H-R-E-W. Shrews have a sharp nose, 
short legs and tail. So the tail is short tail. So your mouse, big ears. Okay, remember the big ears and big eyes with a mouse, even though they really don't have that great an eyesight. But the other senses make up for it. Graded hearing, yeah, they can hear very well, which kind of surprises me because then that old saying, quiet as a mouse, yeah, it's like, well, don't you think they realize how noisy they are? Maybe they'd quiet down a little bit. Yeah, well, no. So that's the difference between the different species. So if you want to talk about field mice, like what I get around here in my nest boxes, those are actually, well, most of the ones that I've seen, and unfortunately I have seen some of them up close in my nest box, uh, those are usually the white-footed mouse or the deer mouse. And I did mention the eastern deer mouse, which is Peromyscus manic colitus okay and that can actually some people consider a deer mouse a generic term as well because it's used for like 50 species or more yeah so there's subspecies of the deer mouse like i said the eastern deer mouse hey i had a species um name for it so that is an actual species the eastern deer mouse but if you say deer mouse Kind of falls under field mouse when there's a bunch of different species underneath it so it does get confusing there's just so many different types of mice out there um, and as i was saying about the diet okay they aren't eating the wood they're just chewing it through it to you know wear their teeth down um, or maybe to make a the hole bigger so they can get in your house easier so yeah they their diet is actually of course cheese no all the cartoons that we used to watch and all the th it's like yeah let's bait our traps with cheese uh, because mice love cheese not true yeah they really don't like cheese i mean they'll eat it but it's not like their favorite food if you put out peanuts and you put out cheese next to it what do you think they're going for first they're going for the peanuts first yeah grain seeds fruits, um, even rotting veggies. They like those more than cheese. And like I said, they are omnivorous. Um, and they do cache their food in the fall so that they don't have to hunt for it in the winter time. It's hard to find food in the winter in you know, the northern part of the U.S. All the food's under snow. That's why the birds migrate. That's why a lot of the animals, I shouldn't say a lot, but um, some of the animals hibernate. Yeah, it's tough in the winter time to find food. So some animals like squirrels and mice, they cache their food. C-A-C-H-E. Not cash like money, but cash. C-A-C-H-E. So they're caching their food, and sometimes they can make a mess doing that. Oh, I've got a good story for you. Several years ago, when I used to ride a motorcycle, I don't anymore. Um, just made my wife too nervous, and... The way people drive nowadays made me nervous. But anyhow, the, when I used to have a motorcycle in the winter time, I would store that in my shed as well. And I never thought about the mice getting into my motorcycle. They were too busy chewing the wires on my lawnmower. But I had some mice who got into my motorcycle the one time. I didn't realize it. In the springtime, I got my motorcycle out. And I, you know, had it all gassed up and cleaned up and ready to go. And I had the battery charging all winter. And I just got on it, started it up, started right up and went down the driveway, started driving down the road on it. And it just was sputtering. Yeah, it just kept sputtering. I kept giving it gas. I came home. I um, checked it out. I put on, you know, a new fuel pump and... Uh, drain the gas out, put new gas in, figuring maybe the water got in the tank. You know, I just cleaned the whole thing out, tried again, sputtered. It's like, what's going on here? So I dug a little deeper, and I decided I better clean the air filter. I took the cover off of the air filter, and when I did, a whole pile of nuts 
and seeds fell to the ground. <laughs> the thing was packed full of peanuts especially, but other nuts too. Yeah, the darn things were raiding my peanut feeder for my birds and cashing it all in my motorcycle air filter. Once I got back cleaned out, my motorcycle ran fine. But like I said, I've had a lot of run-ins with these guys, but I still don't hate them, you know. I understand them, so they're just doing their thing. We just have to learn to live with wildlife, whether we like them or not. So anyhow, um, so they do cache their food. So expect that. Now, I do get mice, or I used to get mice in my shed all the time. They cache their food in different places in my shed. And the thing I hated the most is, oh, you could smell they were in there. Yeah, they just would urinate, and it just reeked of urine and mouse urine, and oh, it was awful. But the interesting thing is, most people don't know this, and you probably don't really care. But mouse urine actually glows. Yeah, it has a fluorescent glow to it. So if you're ever looking to see if you have mice around, and you're looking to see, you know, uh, where's that smell coming from? Take a black light. Yeah, take a black light and shine it at the ground. And if you see, like, little pools of, you know glowing spots, you probably have a mouse in that area. It may lead you right to where they are. So, um, yeah, it glows in the fluorescent. That actually helps the hawks find them. They are actually looking for that fluorescent glow. Birds see in the ultraviolet. So when a hawk is soaring overhead, they're looking down at the ground, and they see a big patch of glowing um, spot on the ground. Probably mouse urine. They don't want to pee in the, inside their hole, so they come out and go to the bathroom, and then they go back in the hole. And it, so they know there's a hole there, and they're going to keep an eye on that spot till they see movement and that mouse comes out. So it actually helps, but interesting fact there. So how are these mice getting into our houses? I mean, I'm sure you have weatherproofed. I'm sure you have a nice tight-fitting house, but... Hey, these guys can fit into small, small openings. Uh, some say they can fit into uh, an opening about the size of a pencil. Eh, it depends on the mouse. It depends on how young they are in the species. Usually it's about a half inch. Maybe a little bit more. Okay, But it's very small. So you may have a very small gap somewhere. And that's where the mouse is fitting in. And that's how they get into our house. Usually up through the eaves, or maybe there's a hole in an outside vent, or, you know, you didn't have a cap on your dryer vent. And so they're finding ways in. All they need is a tiny little hole to get in there. The, I heard a long time ago, oh yeah, they can fit into these small places because their bones actually collapse and turn to jello. And no, that's not true. Not true. Hopefully you didn't shut the podcast off right before I said it's not true because now you're going to believe that their bones do collapse. But no, their bones do not collapse, okay? But they are very small. The largest part of the mouse is the skull. The rest of the bones can squeeze in real tight together. So as long as the skull can fit through, the rest of the body can. And if that, once they find a way in, and they want to make it a permanent way in and out, they will use those sharp teeth, which are, once again, constantly growing, to chew that hole even bigger. So you may find a larger hole that the mice have chewed open so that they can get into the house more. Matter of fact, they did some studies, and they found that mice teeth actually grow at about 0.3 millimeters per day. That's why they're doing this constant chewing and making the holes bigger so that they can get inside easier. So let's talk about these guys who are getting into my nest boxes. Like I said, it's probably the white-footed mouse. At least the ones that I've seen have been the white-footed mice. 
And there's been times where, especially in the springtime, I'm cleaning out my nest boxes. And I will open up a nest box, and sure enough, there's a nest in there. And if I usually dig through carefully, I will find the mouse. I have had times, it's happened a couple of times, where I've opened up the nest box, and the mouse just didn't even wait for me to start poking around. They just came running right out, right up my arm, right off my shoulder, and jumped off my shoulder. <laughs> Scared the daylights out of me. So if you're doing that, be careful. Yeah. I mean, they're probably not going to bite you or nothing. They're probably not going to harm you. They're just trying to get the heck out of there. Yeah, they, they are frightened of you. And you just invaded their home. So be careful of that. But anyhow, those are usually either um, the eastern deer mouse or the white-footed mouse. I mostly find white-footed mice in my nest boxes. Um, the white-footed mouse, they're in there just trying to stay warm in the winter. It's not really their nesting time, their breeding time. The white-footed mouse, they're, it's kind of interesting. They actually have what they call a polygynandrous mating system, which means there's multiple males, multiple females, and they mate with each other. It eliminates the competition. You don't need to fight with the other males to find a female. It's like, okay, so you have multiple mates. It's fine. Except after the female has mated and has made a nest and is ready to have young. And then she is very protective and very territorial. Uh, she will protect those young. But it doesn't mean the male can't go off and have some fun. But, yeah, so that's the way they eliminate the competition. Uh, during mating season, though, the females are usually, you know, more territorial. Now, they can mate year-round. So even in the winter, they can mate, but they usually don't. Usually mating season is primarily between March and November. So they'll start as early as March and they'll go right up until November. The main mating season is spring and then again in the fall. So even during the summer, they're pretty busy, but, you know, they can. After all, you know, they are able to reproduce every three, three weeks. Every three weeks. Yeah. And you wonder why there's so many mice out there. Why, when you find a nest, there is usually, you know, it seems like a million babies. But usually there's only four to six pups. Um, they are what we call altricial. Altricial means that the pups are born naked and eyes are closed and they're pretty much helpless. They're 100% dependent on mom. And that's what altricial means. Precocial means that it's born fully furred, can basically take care of themselves. But mice, no. They are altricial. Gestation period, about 21 days. They are mature, sexually mature in a month. Well, can be a month, month and a half, okay? But they basically, it's very quickly, and they're able to start reproducing themselves. So the babies mature very quickly. Matter of fact, it's only like 12 to 14 days, and they're weaned off of mom, and they're very independent. Now, they will have, and this is the white-footed mouse, they're all pretty similar, but... You know, a couple of minor differences in reproduction between the different species, but uh, they're, they're close. So the white-footed mouse is approximately two to four litters per year. Now, that means they can have approximately 36 babies per year. Let's see, how long do they live? Let's multiply 36 times one. Yeah, they only live about one year. Very short lifespans for mice. Some species only live a matter of a few months. There are some species that'll go a year and a half. You know, lifespan's about a year and a half. But in the wild, most species are only about a year, including the white-footed mouse. So they don't live very long. That's why they have to reproduce. They have to, you know, get their get their offspring out there, keep their keep their species going. And that's kind of hard when you've got all these other animals that are feeding upon you. 
Now, I talked about the red-tailed hawk earlier. Well, you've got all kinds of birds of prey that are going after them. You've got fox, you've got coyotes, you've got wolves, if you have wolves in your area. Uh, you have all different animals going after these poor mice. So if you're having 36 babies a year, you'd be lucky if a quarter of those survived to adulthood. But actually, what's adulthood? Like I said, about 21 days. Yeah, about a month, two months, and they're considered adults. They're already sexually active and breeding. They have to. Short lifespan. Now, in captivity, if you took a... I'm going to use the generic term. If you took a field mouse and you kept it in your house and you took care of it, and they have found in captivity uh, mice will live to be about two years. So it, it pretty much doubles if they're in, in the house. There's no competition. There's no one after them. They're, you know, so they will live longer. They're getting better care. Um, but remember, mice can carry disease. So be careful if you do have a pet mouse, you know, if you, even if you got it from a pet store that can carry disease. The ones in the wild are more likely to because they're getting these viruses and stuff out in the wild. And so they can, you know, spread it to you. Uh, I read somewhere that there's, I think about a hundred or so different viruses and, and diseases that mice can transmit to humans. Oh, wow. Coming up to one of my, sorry to get sidetracked, but you know me, I see something interesting. I always like to talk about it. Hear the chickadee calling in the background. I'm um, sitting on top of a couple of my nest boxes. I've got some bluebirds here. Yeah, it's kind of late in the season, but a lot of bluebirds migrate south for the winter, but some do stick around. Every year that I do the Christmas bird count, my wife and I always run into some bluebirds on the way. So they will stick around all winter. So it's kind of exciting to see them here this late though. Anyhow, they can spread some disease. So when you're cleaning out your nest boxes, uh, where you find maybe a nest in your house and you're cleaning it up, always be careful. Wear a mask, wear gloves, okay? Because they can spread disease. So we call it zoonotic disease. Zoonotic diseases are diseases that are transferred from a wild animal to a human. So, and there are some out there. I mean, there are some diseases that animals have that people can't get from them, but. With mice, unfortunately, there are quite a few. And bringing up, cleaning out nest boxes, should you or shouldn't you? That's a good question. I get asked that quite a bit. It's like, okay, it's the end of the nesting season. Should I clean them out for the winter so that they're ready for the birds in the spring? Um, what do I do? If you look it up online, especially if you go to like a Bluebird Society's website or um, another bird, nesting bird website, they're going to tell you, oh yeah, um, make sure you don't get mice in there. Do what you can to keep the mice out. Uh, well, like I said, mice, think about all the animals that they feed. They're low on the food chain, which means they're an important part of the food chain. If you got rid of every mouse out there, the food chain would collapse. So they're an important part of the food chain. They're all connected. Everything is connected in nature. So mice are important to have. We shouldn't just say, okay, get rid of them all. But should we let them into our nest boxes? Yeah, why not? Yeah, it's a nice warm place for them. Are they bothering you? No. Are they bothering the birds? Eh, not at the time. Can they? Oh, there's a nest box. Another one that's full. Oh, this one actually has some moss in it, too. Well, that's the one that the bluebirds are sitting on. I scared them off already. Um, so there must be a nest in there. So I will stay away. I don't feel like having the mouse run up my arm today. I leave mine. Now, the downside of it. 
Yeah, mice are dirty creatures. I mean, they make their nest in there. They have their food in there. They go in the bathroom in there. And it's, I mean, they're dirty creatures. Can it make the birds sick when they come back? Yeah, it can. Which is why most of these sites are telling you, keep them out of your nest boxes. Well, what I do in the springtime is I go around with my gloves on and my mask, and um, I usually have a stick with me. And I open up the nest box, I'll pull out any nests that are in there, whether they're bird nests from last year. I leave the bird nests in there, okay, over the winter. The reason I do that is because the mice can use them, less energy that they're using. So I leave them in there for the mice. Um, in the springtime, I will pull all the nesting material out, whether it's bird or mouse, and I toss it into the field. And then what I do is I wash it out with warm, soapy water. That way it cleans out any of the bacteria in there, uh, any of the, you know, the dirt. And basically I'm cleaning it out for the birds. Much safer for the birds. After they're cleaned out, and it's not a lot of fun. Remember, I have 26 nest boxes to do this too. But it doesn't take long. I just have a bucket full of hot water. Um, an old rag that I use. Um, I usually will pull everything out. I'll wipe it out with a little brush that I have. So I get all that out and then I just um, take the the rag with some hot water and I just go quickly over it and you know that usually takes care of it. If you want to use vinegar in your water, I've done that before. Um, that kills a lot of um, bad stuff out of it. And then you just close it up and it's ready for the next season. So that's what I do. Some people don't want to go through that trouble. That's fine. That's your call. The mice, they're going to get in there anyhow, unless you're closing the thing off for the winter. Uh, but if you close it off completely, guess what? They're going to find a way in anyhow. Uh, I have seen some people who... Put, and I've done this in the past, many years ago I did this, where I would go and I'd put garbage bags over the top and zip tie the bottom of it. Mostly because I didn't want the bird boxes to get weathered, but it was also to keep the mice out. Now, I let the mice use them in the winter. That's fine. They can use that rather than my house. So that's what I do. What you want to do is up to you. Now, the last thing I want to talk about here is what do you do about the mice that are getting into your sheds and chewing through wires and, you know, causing that terrible odor in there? And what do you do with, like, the mice that are getting into your house? And Okay, I have a lot of people who say, what's the best way to keep them out? And I love when they ask me that. Because that tells me they're doing natural alternatives to poison. Yeah, please, 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 I beg of you, don't use poison to get rid of the mice. The reason is, number one, that poison is getting into the environment. Okay, I don't care what you do, how you contain it, it's still somehow getting into the environment. When you throw that trap out, that poison trap out, it's getting into a landfill. It's getting into the groundwater. It's get, there's still some poison in there, residues. So it's getting into the environment. And the second part is, yeah, you're poisoning that mouse, but it doesn't drop dead immediately. No, it probably drops dead outside in the field. And that fox, coyote, or the hawk, they see it. Free meal. It's not moving. I don't have to chase down. Awesome. So they eat it. Where's that poison going? It's going into that larger predator. Even a small amount can do some damage to that larger predator. Now, if you have a lot of poison out, that's a lot that's getting into that fox, getting into that hawk. So please, avoid poisons. I know it's tempting, it's the easy solution, but there are ways to deter. First of all, check closely for any small openings. 
I know where the mice were getting into my shed. So I closed those openings off. I used caulk, I used boards, I used whatever I could to close them off. Don't use insulation. I mean, I have seen people, and I've done it before in the past, where I just crammed insulation into that little crack. Hey, that's nesting material for those mice. They're loving it. Uh, they're just going to pull it right out. So it doesn't really work. It has to be something solid. So use that caulk. Use whatever you can. It also keeps the drafts out. So it weatherproofs your house as well. So it serves a double purpose. But it keeps the mice from getting in. Are you going to find every little nook and cranny? Probably not. No, I think it's close to impossible to do that. So there are other alternatives or additions to closing all the gaps. Because you probably will miss some. I can't get the doors tight on my shed, and that's where they're getting in. So there's a couple of deterrents. Now, I have heard about these plug-in little sonic things that I've tried them in the house. doesn't work. No. I've had mice in the house before, in my garage, and I have some of those sonic plugins out there. They don't work, in my opinion. Maybe you've had better luck with them. There's a product that they have at some of the garden stores, um, some of the, I don't know what you call them, um, tractor stores is what I'm thinking, but um, basically they have this product that comes in a bag, and it's a lot of different herbs that let out this odor and it supposedly deters the mice and i shouldn't even say supposedly i should say it does because i have tried them i've put them in my shed i've put them in my attic and they have kept the mice away now unfortunately they don't seem to last all winter long so i have had to go out and replace them and i also someone told me once that if you use soap. Now, it can't be just any type of soap. Irish Spring soap. Yeah, Irish Spring, for some reason, the smell of Irish Spring keeps the mice away. It deters them. So I actually bought some Irish Spring a few years back, and I cut it into quarters, a bar into quarters, and I put them all over my attic, and I put them in my shed, and after I did that, I didn't have problems with the mice. So for some reason, Irish Spring, once again, you have to replace them over time. Um, I actually found if you cut it in quarters, and then after like a month or a month and a half, I went up in my attic and I cut the quarters into thirds, and it let more of the odor out. Or you could just shave it off. Yeah, just do shavings of it. And then put the rest of the bar in a plastic bag that... Basically, it's that odor that's scaring them away. So try it. Also, they make humane traps. It's not those terrible mouse traps that snap on the poor thing. Maybe it doesn't bother you. It bothers me. Sorry. I love all animals. So they do make traps for mice, and they're humane. Bait them with peanuts or peanut butter. Not cheese. Remember, they're not a big cheese critter. Bait it with peanuts, peanut butter, and basically it draws them in, door closed behind them, take them far, far away. Don't just take them outside and let them out. They're coming right back into your house. So take them far away and release them. They don't have babies in the winter. More than likely, they don't have babies in the winter. So it's not like you're taking, you know, mom away from the babies. They're probably solitary by that time. So just trap them take them somewhere and release them and a lot of these humane traps they are pretty safe to handle so but I still recommend gloves mask when you do so that's my recommendation for keeping them out or if they already are in your house deterring them chasing them out or trapping them and getting them out of there don't just go and poison them. Don't just kill them. Remember, they are an important part of the ecosystem, part of the food chain, part of the food web. Well, that's about all I have to say about mice for today. Remember, 
you can still use the term field mouse, but when you do, you're using a generic term that means a lot of different species. Probably if you live in the Northeast like me, you're talking about the Eastern deer mouse or the white-footed mouse. So very interesting animals, mice. And I'm going to close at that. And I'd like to thank you for joining me on my adventure into nature, my wandering through my backyard. Please remember to rate and review the podcast and invite your friends to listen to it, too. Um, We really need to get the word out about how wonderful nature is. And the only way to do that is if you keep inviting all your friends and we get more people listening and learning more about nature. And don't forget, some of your ideas of what you want to hear about. We're in a all new season here and I'd like to do more episodes from, about things that you want me to talk about. So anything to do with nature. If I don't know about it, I'll learn about it and I'll share it with you and everyone else. So get those requests sent to me. My you can contact me through my Instagram page, which is the Nature Wanderer underscores in between each word. You can also contact me through my Facebook page, The Nature Wanderer, or you can check out my website and contact me through there at naturewanderer.org. There is no the on there. Um, And don't forget, you can not only do local shopping for your Christmas gifts, but you can also go to my online store for Nature Wander merch. I am opening a new store. I found a new online store platform that has a lot more merchandise. It's a lot nicer too and reasonably priced. So check that out. I should have it open in the next couple of weeks. And you can also support the Nature Wander podcast through my Ko-Fi page or through my Patreon page. You can become a patron, which gives you some extras, like some classes, some lessons, uh, some extra videos. So join me on all these things. And above all, keep exploring the nature around you. Thanks and have a great day. Hello, nature lovers. Do you love to read books like I do? I've always enjoyed reading books ever since I was a kid, especially books about nature. Unfortunately, as I get older, I find myself with less and less time to sit down with a good book. I've solved that problem with Audible. Audible allows you to listen to your favorite titles while you are driving at the gym, taking a walk, wherever you are. With all the latest titles, you'll have quite a selection to choose from. And they have podcasts, too. Start listening today with a free 30-day trial. To get your free 30-day trial, go to the show notes and click on the link. Happy listening.